once again to EWTN's bookmark. A very special guest, Dr. Scott Hahn is here, the fourth cup unveiling the mysteries of the Last Supper and the Cup, published by Image, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. No introduction, obviously, but uh, thank you so much for stopping by a Bookmark. We've done many conversations we over sure the years. Have. You're a central figure to many people's uh, conversions and reversions to the faith over the years here at EWTN, certainly from Mother Angelica. And, and in reading the fourth cup and even hearing the title, I was flashing back right. to the late 1980s and around 1990, around the time that I and my wife kind of kind of reverted back to the faith. Yeah, so I came into the church in 86, and the research that went into this book was sort of what gave rise to the grace of conversion. And so within the next three years or so, I had many opportunities to share my own story. Mm -hmm. And in the part of, you know, as part of sharing the story, I also would give a second talk. And mm -hmm. so going back to 89, when I first connected with Terry Barber and St. Joseph Communications, right, right. Mm -hmm. he did the one talk called Protestant Minister Becomes Catholic. Yeah, the one that puts uh, how everywhere. many tens yeah. of thousands. Yeah, 30,000 in one year, right. I think three or four million altogether. Right, is that what it is? Yeah. Wow. And then uh, I was invited in the fall of 89, when I was still living in Joliet, to come up to Marytown in Libertyville, Illinois, and to give two talks. And so I gave one called Rome Sweet Home, mm -hmm. and the other one was called The Fourth Cup. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, this book has been 30 years in the making. Mm -hmm. And it even goes back, it predates my conversion by about four or five years, mm -hmm. because this is really the first big step I took mm -hmm. towards the Eucharist, mm -hmm. when I was still considered anti-Catholic by my friends, and mm -hmm. I still thought of myself as sort of an arch Calvinist right. and so anti-Catholic as well. Speaking of uh, Calvinists and anti-Catholics, you dedicate this to some guy named Marcus Grodi. <laughs> Why did you decide to dedicate this particular book to Marcus? Because when I was uh, first, be when I was first going around giving talks, he was still a Presbyterian minister. I think it was the year ninety, and he was near Cleveland, and he came to give he came to hear me give it to, uh, two talks actually. Mm -hmm and the first one was the fourth cup. Mm -hmm. And he told me later he came just for a good laugh. He sat in the front row, I don't know if he remembers <laughs> this, but his arms were folded, he was just shaking his head, like, I can't believe, I can't believe you, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the talk on the fourth cup, his head was in his hands. Mm -hmm. And he came up afterwards and he said, when we're done, can we take a walk? Mm -hmm. And so we did, and we talked about the Eucharist, we talked about the scriptures, the old and the new, the liturgy, and I gave him some books, and he read voraciously, and right. within the next year or so, he came into the church, he became a Catholic, and then around that same time, we just kind of brainstormed and came up with the, the Coming Home Network, right, with, right. Uh, with Marcus, with Kimberly, with me, and Father Ray Ryland back then. Right, I remember. But it was the fourth cup right. that I spoke on. Okay. And so it just always was a connection for me and him. And what's the connection with the uh, Colombo in, in your mind? Well, you know, I had a, a, a pastor when I was a seminarian who was also my Old Testament professor and he was my Hebrew instructor. He was probably the single biggest influence on my life at that point. And he asked a question in the middle of a sermon. It was on uh, Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, what did Jesus mean when right. he said, and you recount finished. that in the book here. That's right. right, right. And so for me, I just wanted to go search out the clues like Columbo. For me, it was all detective work back then. It was mm -hmm. so much excite so much excitement. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of fancied myself a, a theological detective a la Columbo, the big and, Peter Falk show. And the big then. question you start off with in chapter one is what is finished? Yeah. Well, well, because when Jesus says that in John 19, every evangelical Protestant like me knows the answer. What is finished, redemption is done. Mm -hmm. You know, our salvation is complete. That's the it. And in the very same moment he asked the question from the pulpit, he could read our minds. Mm -hmm. And so he said, you know, if you're thinking that salvation is complete, not so fast. Mm -hmm. Romans 4.26 says, you know, he was raised for our justification. And so the resurrection is not something secondary mm -hmm. to our salvation. So whatever he's referring to when he says it is finished, it isn't the completion of redemption. It mm -hmm. must be something else. But I digress. And so he went back mm -hmm. to what, what he was talking about. And I just couldn't believe he would ask a question that he right. didn't have the answer to from the pulpit. Right, you came up to him at the end of the uh, yeah. service, right, to say, come on. That's right. You don't do that kind of thing, you right. know. Right. And he, he playfully. But he challenged you, yeah, right? Yeah, he teased me. He right. said, you know, you're going to have the answer to that in no time, so mm -hmm. get to work, you know. And right. so I did. I thought, well, I'll give it an afternoon. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'll give it a week, <laughs> you know. I gave it a year, mm -hmm. and that's really when all of the clues began to line up and point to me. Right. 
you know, at point of the Eucharist to me and point of me towards the Eucharist. Right, and some of the uh, members of your fold who had been former Catholics were concerned of over your Romanistic tendencies. Yeah, well, I mean, they could sense that this is not just the Lord's Supper, as they had come to believe when they left the Catholic Church, that there was something a whole lot more. Once you go into the Old Testament roots for the Holy Eucharist, once you recognize it's a Passover, it's the Passover of the New Covenant, then it's not reducible just to a meal, mm -hmm. because the Passover was first and foremost a sacrifice. It was the sacrifice that really set into motion the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, as St. Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians 3. And so I, I'm, I'm just ferreting out all the clues. I'm right. really playing the detective. I'm open to whatever the Bible says. I just never imagined in my wildest dreams it could be Catholic. Right at the beginning of chapter one, you said, I was living the dream, my dream anyway. I was touring with the Continentals playing lead guitar. No, uh, in Europe. <laughs> uh, I was pursuing studies for ministry in the Presbyterian Church. So was that your second dream after? Well, you know, touring you're, with your you're, band. You're referring <laughs> to how I played guitar right out of high school with the Continentals. My dream back then, before I went to college, was to be a professional guitarist. Mm -hmm. And I went out to LA and I met real guitarists. Mm -hmm. I was the best guitarist in Pittsburgh, so I was told. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been in the 15th percentile in Los Angeles. So you wouldn't so, have been with the hit makers and no sitting way. in the studio playing, no, being a studio musician. No. And so after three months of touring a concert a day, I got it out of my system. Mm -hmm. And I went off to college and I realized, okay, I'm going to make that my avocation. I'm going to make scripture my vocation. And frankly, those three months of touring with the band, I was discovering my passion for the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you say my Christianity was evangelical in style, Calvinist in substance. What does that mean? That basically God gets all the glory, so man can't take any credit. And so you picture God as the sovereign Lord. And of course he is the Lord, and of mm -hmm. course he is sovereign. But what you discover over the time it took for me to read the old and the new in harmony is that the true revelation of the new covenant is the unveiling of the face of the Father. Mm -hmm. You can't reduce God's identity to, creation, to creator because he, he's eternal, mm -hmm. creation's not. And so who is God eternally? Well, we didn't know until the Father sent the Son. Mm -hmm. And so once you begin to realize that God is a father, then no good father is threatened when his kids grow up. In fact, that's how he's glorified, precisely by endowing his sons and daughters with his own life, mm -hmm. with his own grace. And so I began to realize this vision of God as sovereign Lord implies a tug of war between creator right. and creature, but it's a non-competitive family. That's the whole essence of the covenant. Now you talk about the fact that when you were deciding where you were gonna go to church, I thought this was interesting. At the time, I thought of worship as a mostly intellectual exercise, a concentrated Bible study ornamented with hymns and prayers. And I always think like kind of the rap on Catholics is that it's uh, it's just intellectualism. You're doing this, you know, kind of ritual with the intellectual, but it, there's no heart, there's no personal relationship. Yeah. But you're actually talking about it being an intellectual exercise on the Protestant well, you know, side. Well, in as much as almost every Protestant congregation tends to be pastor-centered, mm -hmm. and every Protestant service tends to be sermon-centered, we only celebrated the Lord's Supper, as we called it, four times a year. Mm -hmm. And so the sermon was the main event, and everything else was court, sort of built up for that. And so you basically went to where you'd hear the hottest sermons, and it was a slam dunk for us. It was an easy call. Even if it involved like a 30 minute, 35 minute drive, we knew where to go. And a lot mm -hmm. of my fellow seminarians would also hike up there with us to hear this amazing preacher. Mm -hmm. Covenant, anybody who's listened to you over the years, read any of your stuff knows how important covenant is. You even say covenant was a central theme of the theology of your hero, right. reformer John Calvin. So how did that getting focused on the covenant take you into Catholicism and away from Calvinism? Well, you know, you can't read the Bible very seriously and not recognize the central importance of covenant, old covenant, new covenant. But you can't be part of our culture without mistaking covenant for contract. And so in ancient Israel, a contract involved the exchange of property. This is, this is yours, that is mine. But in a covenant formulation, you always hear, I am yours and you are mine. I will be your God, you will be my people. And the Hebrew word for people, as I learned in seminary, am literally means kinsman, you're, you're his family. And so switching gears from covenant as contract to covenant as kinship mm -hmm. began to, well, I thought I'll just make one minor adjustment, but you can't make something that minor mm -hmm. when you're really dealing with a concept so major. And so studying how the old fulfills, you know, the old is fulfilled in the new, you, know, you, you begin to recognize that, wow, this is more than a contractual exchange mm -hmm. between Jesus and me. This is something that God is doing as father for the whole human race as his family. So what do you say to people say, well, you're just reading things back in? 
you're taking it like the early Christians, you're just kind of fitting things that work for you to explain the way things are now. Well, I mean, there's a sense in which we have to read the Bible in both directions. You know, Soren Kierkegaard famously said that you live your life forward, but you can only understand it backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you read the Bible and it goes from the old to the new. But then when you read the old in light of the new and you recognize all of the preparation that went into the fulfillment of Christ, mm -hmm. then it's not projecting my voice into the Bible. It's discovering the voice of God. And as Augustine said, the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed in the new. And when you see that pattern of promise and mm -hmm. fulfillment, you know, no longer do you have to debate divine inspiration. Mm -hmm. It's patently obvious. And suddenly you begin to realize the riches of the tradition that you read in the early church fathers makes the Bible come alive more than my favorite preachers and teachers did. Well, you talk about the Passover and the covenant in, in chapter two and Passover for us for the first century Jews as Jews today, more than a holiday. It's been the holiday re festival of redemption. What was surprising to me was there seemed to be some disagreement in, among scholars over the fact of whether what Jesus was celebrating on Holy Thursday if it was Holy Thursday versus Tuesday or whatever right, day right. of the week it might have been, was in fact a Passover. And to some degree, why should we care? Well, you know, at one level, back in the 80s, a lot of Protestant biblical scholarship was so lopsidedly historical critical that you didn't take at face value what you find completely explicit in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so because John seems to imply that Jesus is dying there on Good Friday in John chapter 19. Mm -hmm. You know, not a bone of his shall be broken. Exodus 12, 46, that points to the Passover lamb mm -hmm. and the hyssop branch that is used to raise the sponge with a sour wine up to his lips. There's so many Passover elements there, but that's right. all you actually subsequent have a, You to, actually have a list inside the book. Of that's kind right. Of list of those in there. So what I had to do was to search through the historical evidence and you know both Jewish and Christian sources alike converge I think overwhelmingly mm -hmm. that what the synoptic evangelist Matthew Mark and Luke are explicitly saying mm -hmm. is true right. that they gathered in the upper room to celebrate the Passover but they weren't just celebrating he was fulfilling it and transforming the old into the new by doing things that were very familiar but then suddenly doing things that were entirely unfamiliar this is my body what is that this is the cup yeah, of was my there blood. a lamb yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a debate Speaking of a lamb supper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I tend to think there was a lamb, but that it was obscured because Jesus was now revealing himself as the true lamb. Right. You say, in biblical religion, memory is not simply the psychological act of recalling a past event. Rather, it is the representation of the event. Thus, even today, when Jews observe the Passover, they speak of themselves as participants in the Exodus. That's right. Well, in Hebrew, zakar, to remember, or zikaron, the Hebrew word for the memorial sacrifice, is translated into Greek as anamnesis, which is the precise term that Jesus uses when he says, do this as a memorial or in remembrance of me. So they would have recognized the fact that, first of all, that's a liturgical statement. That is a technical liturgical term. But more specifically, it's tapping into something rooted in the notion of covenant. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Doesn't mean set your alarm, wake up on Saturday and remember that it's, this, mm -hmm. it's the Sabbath. No, you celebrate, you commemorate. And so the way we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, we didn't forget that our kids were born all the other days of the year, mm -hmm. but we're really focusing on them to celebrate and to renew the bonds. And when you see that, you recognize why the early church fathers made so much of the fact that the Eucharist is not just a meal, it's a sacrifice and especially a memorial. And that's what you started looking at is the early church fathers and to see what they thought about what was going on. You say, I was beginning to realize how revolutionary Christianity must have seemed in the ancient world. You go on to say in the first and second centuries, the most striking thing about Christianity was probably how little it looked like a religion. Why? That's right. Because universally speaking, 2,000 years ago, there were multiple religions and every single religion had the same central act and that was animal sacrifice. So suddenly, within the first 50 years, the Eucharist and baptism are universal wherever Christianity is spread. And yet at the same time, the one thing that Christians didn't do, that everybody did, was animal sacrifice. And so from a Protestant perspective, it's because we did away with sacrifice, no. From the patristic perspective, mm -hmm. when you read the new, not abolishing, but fulfilling the old, mm -hmm. then you recognize exactly what Malachi was talking about, that everywhere my name is called upon, there'll be a clean sacrifice, a mm -hmm. clean oblation offered in my name. Mm -hmm. 
And so vividly it became apparent to me that there is sacrifice, it just isn't animal slaughter anymore. Mm -hmm. You say the Hebrews were delivered from death and liberated from Egypt, not because they deserved to be saved, not because they were innocent, but because God is merciful. That's right. Yeah, this is the sworn mercy we hear about in the Canticle of Zechariah back in Luke 1, because you go back four centuries before ancient Israel is being delivered from Egyptian bondage, and God is rewarding Abraham's faithful obedience by swearing this covenant oath to bless his descendants and he doesn't add any conditions. If they're as faithful and as obedient as you are, no. He's blessing a father in a way that really touches a father's heart because you have done this. You have not withheld your only beloved son. I am going to bless them and use them to bless all of the nations as well. You say the Lord God makes clear that he instituted sacrifice not for his own sake, but for ours. He doesn't get hungry or thirsty. That's right. God gets nothing out of sacrifice. God gets nothing out of creating the world and redeeming it as well. So you have to wonder why did, why go to all of that trouble? Mm -hmm. If you're not getting any more glory than you already had, and he can't because it's already infinite, well, the answer is obvious. Once you see it from the Father's eyes, he's not creating the world to get more mm -hmm. glory for himself, but to give more and more of himself to us. That's what sacrifice does. It opens us up to receive much more from him. Now, you see uh, the Passover then as kind of a four-course meal. You, you talk about it as far as the Seder itself. And it's interesting you break that down, but you also point out that the information for this doesn't come from the earliest sources. No, it's the Mishnah around 200 AD. Okay. Yeah, so the first step of my process of investigation was looking at the first Passover back in Exodus 12 that they celebrated while they were still in Egypt. The second stage was to ask myself, well, what was it like in the first century? Because everything surrounding Jesus' crucifixion, everything that illuminates the meaning of what Jesus said, it is finished, has something to do with the Passover. And so there was a a near consensus that what the Mishnah is doing in 200 AD is certainly not innovation, because at that point, Jews have no temple, they have no holy city. You're not innovating, you're consolidating, you're trying to preserve all of the traditions mm -hmm. that you remember. And so this is why when you read in Luke 22, it's clearly the case that they had multiple mm -hmm. cups in the upper room. So why would they have multiple cups? Well, the Mishnah confirms the fact mm -hmm. that going way back, we have four cups. We have the preliminary course, and which is the, mm -hmm. the cup of Kedush, and then you have this second one where you have the Exodus narrative read in Exodus 12, mm -hmm. and that is the, the cup of the Haggadah, because that's the term for reciting the whole narrative from mm -hmm. Exodus. And then you have this cup of blessing, the cup of Barakah, and that's exactly what Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, when he's talking about the Eucharist. Now, What's he doing, just coming up with a new phrase? No, he's echoing a familiar phrase that any Jew would know, especially Jewish Christians, because it was the third cup, mm -hmm. the cup of Barakah, of blessing, that Jesus consecrates. And that leads into the great Hillel. Psalms 114, 115, 116, 117, 118 are all sung, and then you have the great cup of Hillel, the cup of praise or the cup of consummation. And that's precisely what Jesus skipped and of course, no Christian who's just coming from a Gentile background is going to notice the omission. The omission is obvious, mm -hmm. though, to every Jewish reader, especially Rabbi David Dalby of Oxford, who points out how glaring is the omission of the fourth cup. But mm -hmm. he doesn't just skip it. Right before he leaves, he says, you know, truly I say to you, I'm not going to taste of the fruit of the vine again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's clear that he's, in, he's intending not to drink what his disciples are expecting to right. drink. And so that's what led me to Gethsemane. The third clue was why does he pray three times, Father, take this cup from me. What cup is that? Mm -hmm. Well, given the fact that just a few minutes ago he had finished the third cup but skipped the fourth cup, I began to wonder if in fact that couldn't be an allusion to mm -hmm. the cup that he was expected to drink but didn't because he wasn't just celebrating the Passover one last time, mm -hmm. he was fulfilling it by transforming it into the new Passover because he was becoming the lamb. Mm -hmm. And so when you trace the trajectory of you know, the Via Dolorosa, he refuses the wine mingled with myrrh, but then in John 19, he says, I thirst. And obviously he had been thirsting for hours, but he says this to fulfill the scripture. And so all of the evangelists noticed that they hoisted a sponge 
up right, to his lips. Right, right. But only John was an eyewitness, and so only John tells us what he did with that, because you probably would conclude, if we only had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that, well, he said he was going to drink. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, but he does. Mm -hmm. And also, John notices that it's a hyssop branch straight out of Exodus 12. And so as soon as he drinks, he says, tell telestai. It is consummated. Mm -hmm. It is finished. And so suddenly you can also see why Father Raymond Brown, mm -hmm. a historical critical Catholic scholar, and others too, connect what he's saying in John 18, 11 to Peter in the garden. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has for me? So you have the three cups, the prayer of Gethsemane concerning the fourth cup, mm -hmm. and then he drinks that wine there at the cross to consummate mm -hmm. what really is the new covenant Passover. Okay. Now, it's also interesting here because uh, you talk about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, that they may have all practiced, you know, how they did Passover, etc., slightly differently. And you, and you quote uh, Jobert. That's right, uh, Professor Jobert. Uh, Jobert about the early church co commemorated the Last Supper not on the night before Good Friday, but on the Tuesday before. That's right. I mean, this is a debatable proposition. You know, good friends of mine and I differ. You know, Brant Petrie, uh, who I respect greatly, you know, he takes this idea that it was Holy Thursday. And if I'm wrong, I would be grateful. I take the view that St. Epiphanius took, that the Didascalia Apostolorum also refers to, and a number of other patristic sources uh, that you have Tuesday night would have been the 14th of Nisan, according to the strict observance of the solar calendar, mm -hmm. which would leave plenty of time for Wednesday, where he has the Jewish trials, and then right. Thursday when he has the Roman trials. Right. Because if you're trying to squeeze, you know, if it's all Thursday night, right. then between midnight and about 9 a.m., right. you've got to squeeze about There's five a lot or six trials. Everybody's pulling an all-nighter. It always know? reminded me of the end of Gone with the Wind where they had to wrap everything up. All these people started dropping very quickly. All these events happened. Right. You know, it's one almost after too the, quickly. Yeah, and, like how did this all fit in that time frame, which is what some people question. Right. And so about, right? You know, I would say that the Didascalia, in a non-debative style, just matter-of-factly states, and this is third century, early third century at the, uh, the latest, that you know, it was Tuesday night that we celebrated mm -hmm. the Passover, and then Wednesday the trials with Caiaphas and Annas, and back to, to Caiaphas, and then Pilate mm -hmm. to Herod, back to Pilate again on Thursday, and then he's sentenced to die and crucified on Friday. And that chronology fits not only the Gospels well, because the Synoptic Evangelists don't tell us the days or the hours as mm -hmm. to, if we just read the Synoptic Gospels, I'd point out, we would assume the public ministry was only one year. But John oh, gives us okay. three Passovers, mm -hmm. so John sort of supplements. And I think it's important to see that John is deliberately supplementing the synoptic tradition, which I think he assumes his readers already know. Mm -hmm. And I think when we read the two together in a symphony, the synoptic right. gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, I mean, right. a lot of scholars would say, oh, you've stepped out of bounds there. You can't read those things in a complementary mm -hmm. way. But of course, in the tradition, we always have. And when we do, I think this is what we come up with. You say, also in, in, your, in your studying, you say, under fatherly advice, you like those little titles. Uh, those puns lamentations is one of the best here. Now I discovered the fathers were sensitive and careful readers of the scriptures. They were not fanciful as I had sometimes been led to believe. Yeah, I mean, back in seminary, there was a big debate. Can we interpret the Old Testament the way the New Testament writers do? Mm -hmm. You know, it seemed obvious. Well, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He doesn't add except when I'm interpreting the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. That's when I exercise my apostolic license. You know, you're not apostle, so you mm -hmm. can't. But a number of Protestants warned us that if mm -hmm. we interpret the Old Testament the way the New Testament writers do, that's going to lead straight to Catholicism, because mm -hmm. that's what the medievals were all doing. And I sloughed that off. I, okay. It's not what they were doing, but you know, we should do it. But I, I, I realized that a lot of the accusations against the early church fathers about the excessive typology, that they were seeing the Old Testament fulfilled which everywhere. You, which you talk about in the book. That's right. Yeah, They're the hyper typers. Yeah. Right. When in fact, what they were doing was echoing and resonating exactly what Jesus and the apostles were doing throughout the New Testament. And I imagine what our Lord was doing on the road to Emmaus there mm -hmm. in Luke 24 for those hours that he spent opening up the law and the prophet to show how he had fulfilled that to Clopas and his companion before they arrived at the village. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in, in talking about how the book came together, one of the things that was pointed out was you were saying how you gave this talk so many times, but somebody pointed out to you, but you never gave it exactly the same way. Yeah, I, I gave it over a hundred times and it was recorded at least a dozen times. And so mm -hmm. I looked at the transcripts and I realized they were right. Every time it comes out differently and every time it feels like it's new, it's fresh mm -hmm. for me. 
And so what I did in compiling this book, because this was a book that was in the making for a quarter of a century, mm -hmm. it really is in some ways uh, a sequel to uh, Rome Sweet Home, because I gave those two talks back in 89 at the same time. The one became a book and the other one didn't. Mm -hmm. It's also a kind of prequel to The Lamb's Supper. Supper. Okay. Yeah, because everything that I'd been doing up until the time I actually attended my first mass at Marquette, mm -hmm. you know, this was all the investigation into the Passover, the old and the new. Right, and The Lamb's Supper, probably the most popular series we've you we've know. ever had, I would say, fairly. Another book in the works, you usually have something going on. Oh, yeah. I've got another book in the works. It's called The uh, First Society, mm -hmm. The Sacrament of Matrimony and the Restoration of Social Order. Okay. We could use that. You better rush that book yeah. out very quick. Uh, it's Thank coming you. out soon. Thank you, Dr. Thank on you, the Doug. Fourth Cup, Unveiling the Mysteries of the Last Supper and the Cross. And you will find this quite interesting. A lot of new information, things for you to think about from a wonderful, wonderful talk years ago, the fourth cup, we all know it. Dr. Scott Hahn, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. Put that on your list. We'll see you next time right here on Bookmark.